Okay, welcome back to Toronto SMNR. Today we have um, Sing Shen. She will talk about an uh, empirical investigation of representation learning for imitation. Um, she's currently conducting research with Professor Stuart Russell's group at the Center for Human Compatible AI, UC Berkeley. Her research goal is to ensure the safety, alignment, and robustness of machine learning system, especially in re uh, reinforcement learning and imitation learning. She has published papers at top conferences and cares deeply about developing beneficial AI. To help out the field, she has been organizing share of safe AI workshops at IIA um, and IJC AI since 2019. Prior to this, she has spent her time at the University of Hong Kong, Stanford University, and Columbia University. Thanks, Cynthia, to uh, prepare the talk and to give the talk remotely from um, Beijing, China. Um, take it away. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Um, I'm Cynthia, and today I'm going to share our work and empirical investigation of representation learning for imitation. This work is done jointly with the Center for Human Compatible AI at UC Berkeley, the University of Hong Kong, and Google Research. We'll also be presenting this at NeurIPS in, in just a few days, actually. Um, some of my co-authors are also with us today, and I borrowed these slides made by Sam. Uh, maybe Sam will arrive soon. <laughs> Feel free to ask us any questions later. So our focus is on imitation learning, because if we compare imitation learning to reinforcement learning, we can find that first, it does not require very tedious reward design. We know that having an accurate and well-shaped reward function is quite crucial for reinforcement learning, but this can be quite challenging in many real-world applications. And secondly, it, it typically needs much less compute. This is especially true for behavior cloning, which is essentially just supervised learning. But at the same time, it has the disadvantage of requiring some high-quality expert demonstrations. These demonstrations are usually given by humans, but as we know, humans are slow and this collection process uh, can be quite expensive <clears throat> in comparison to algorithms. Our goal is thus to train higher quality policies without collecting more demonstrations. And this is relevant to self-supervised learning. So for the past few years, self-supervised learning has been proven to be quite helpful at many tasks, such as computer vision and natural language processing. For example, in this Zoff's paper, we can see that when the data set is limited, using ImageNet pre-train can significantly improve the performance on COCO detection. And for language models, this Radford paper shows that the task performance increases as the number of pre-training updates going up. So we were curious about whether the same conclusion can be applied to imitation learning. And if so, are there task-independent representation learning strategies that are useful for imitation learning? We believe there are some values in creating a benchmark to systematically investigate this problem. So we created a framework to analyze existing algorithms and implemented this framework into a high quality code base. We call it the early benchmark, which is the abbreviation of empirical investigation of representation learning for imitation. Um, it consists of some modular and reusable implementations of a range of existing representation learning algorithms. We also did an extensive examination of how popular algorithms influence imitation learning. Here we show the framework of our implementation. We first prepare the representation learning data set, then construct the context and target. This context here is typically the original image and the target is usually some other related input. Sometimes it can be the original image itself and at other times, it can be a possibly be a transformed version of the original image. For example, in BAE, both context and target are the same original input images. But if we want the network to learn environment dynamics information, for example, this target here is usually 
set to be the state observation after the next time step. Some algorithms might optionally augment both the context and target, then feed them into an encoder. This encoder generates representations, then passes them onto a decoder. We then apply representation learning loss at the decoder output. So this framework overall is the representation learning stage. In most settings, people will just take the encoder weights onto their downstream tasks. In our case, this would be several imitation learning algorithms where we just sample state and expert action from our demonstrations and then apply imitation learning loss for update. We also implemented another training flow, which is to jointly learn both IL and representation learning. This is done by using this representation learning loss as an auxiliary loss to imitation learning updates. Okay, I want to pause a bit and see if people have any questions up until this slide. If no, maybe I'll proceed. Okay, so many existing algorithms can fit into this training flow and we can further break them down with more design considerations. For example, algorithms may have different tasks. They, these tasks can be reconstruction tasks like VAE or contrastive tasks like Sinclair or Moco. This is mostly relevant to how we construct the representation learning loss. And different algorithms may pick their own downstream algorithms. This can be reinforcement learning, imitations, computer vision, et cetera. Um, we just described the context and target and the selection of specific contexts and targets vary a lot according to different algorithms choice. And some algorithms might optionally have action prediction. So basically they provide action label as additional information to either the encoder or the decoder. Um, some of them may also have augmentation use momentum for encoder updates or attaching a, pro a projection head to the decoder or use compression in their loss. And some of these algorithms might choose to be either a pre-trained algorithm or a joint training loss. With this framework, we can then study different features of algorithms under this. This is a summary of many words in reinforcement learning. And we can also analyze many other methods in computer vision like this. So in our code base, it, it is quite easy to define new representation learners. For example, here we show our implementation of the MoCo algorithm. In MoCo, we specify how we want to construct the target. We might want to apply image augmentations to both the context and target and specify that we want our batches to be in the form of a queue and use momentum for encoder. We can then define the decoder, even if it's just no, no operation and define the loss calculator here. We think this framework is quite flexible and, it, and it's also quite easy to extend to new representation learning algorithms. In our experiment, we evaluated five representation learning algorithms. So temporal CPC and Simclear here are both contrastive algorithms, and they are asked to pair their given observations with an augmented version of their targets. The dynamics ta task here is to predict the next state observation, given the current state and the action taken. Inverse dynamics does the opposite, which is to predict the action taken given two consecutive observations. We evaluate these representation learning algorithms on three imitation learning approaches. One is the behavior cloning with representation pre-training and another is BC with representation joint training. So if you remember, the joint training setting is just treating the representation learning loss as an auxiliary loss. And the third setting is scale with representation learning pre-training on both policy and the discriminator. We evaluate all these settings on three environments. 
deep mind control, magical and progen. I think for people who are in within the robotics field should be pretty familiar with deep mind control and in general magical set of tasks. So these involves a, a lot of um, actuators and trying to complete some tasks. And for magical, um, this is a benchmark for testing generalization and robustness for policies. Its environments usually involve having a robot complete some tasks. For example, in this demonstration environment, a robot should grab some objects and put them into a region with the same color. But this environment can have several variants in order to test an agent's learned knowledge. For example, we can change the color of this target object and its region and the shaded region. We can change the shape of the objects. And also we can change the room layout for this robot. And another benchmark is progen. This is a benchmark also for testing generalization. And in here, I put some images on coin run environment. These agents here must find ways to get around obstacles and enemies to get the coin here. Tasks in this progen benchmark might vary in their background images and also the sequence of um, how obstacles and enemies might show up. This setting also makes it harder for an agent to memorize action sequences so we can actually test its robustness. Okay, so before we get into the actual experiment results, here is a quick recap of our training flow. And note that in our later slides, if we do not explicitly state that an experiment doesn't use image augmentation, um, by default, aug augmentation is always applied. So here we show the experiment results. We found that Image augmentations can help a lot in behavioral cloning. In this table, we compare everything with the baseline on BC without image augmentation. So everything marked with an asterisk here stands for having a p-value smaller than 0.05 on one-sided t-test. So basically, it means these results are significantly better than this baseline. We can see that image augmentation helps under quite many settings. This holds for BC pre-trained here, and also BC with joint training. However, if we change the baseline by changing from BC with no augmentations to BC with augmentations, the, our conclusion can change quite a bit. So we can see that if we use this BC with augmentations as our baselines, representation learning doesn't provide much extra values. This table is for BC with pre-trained, and this is for joint training. If we go back again, we can see that changing our comparison baseline makes the number of asterisks drop quite significantly. And the same pattern holds for Gale too, except that it seems Gale requires more rigorous regularization techniques. This table is using Gale without image augmentation as our baseline. And similarly, this one is, with, is using Gale with augmentations. If we compare these two tables, we can still see the same pattern. So representation learning, it, it seems that representation learning doesn't provide much extra value than image augmentations. Okay. Sorry, sorry can I ask a question? Yes, sure. Hey, Cynthia. Uh, can, can you talk a bit about, uh, I might've missed this uh, in the beginning of the talk, but can you talk a bit about uh, what's the range of augmentations, but what are the types? Okay, so for, Image augmentations, we typically use um, random crop and also transition a bit. And we might also use um, color jitter, so um, randomly changing the color setting of the images. Um, maybe there are one or two more, but I can't remember clearly now. Mm -hmm. yeah. but, the, but the, deta the detail is in the paper, yeah. 
and and the representations that I learned that are learned here are based on uh, either one or two frames, but not they're not video representations, for example. Um, so here, um, I think these are all um, final testing results. So maybe these are all th these are not just representations generated. So you can imagine um, these asterisks here actually refers to the actual numbers, uh, the final results in the paper. Right, right. But uh, when you for your representation uh, learning losses, uh, essentially you have you're trying to uh, essentially these representations are trained based on uh, two consecutive inputs uh, at most. They are not uh, they are not trained based on um, uh, you know, videos. Mm, no, yeah, right. They are not trained on videos in this sense. Just to do jump you... in quickly. So we do train it on frame stacks. So it's not quite like a video in the sense, like it's still like a finite set of frames and a fixed set of frames. Mm -hmm. But I think we typically use a frame stack of four. Mm -hmm. So in this case, we're looking at kind of trying to predict the subsequent or, or the sort of offset frame stack of four from the current frame stack of four in, in cases where the target is the subsequent frame. Like in some cases, like SimClear, you aren't actually trying to do a temporally offset prediction. You're just trying to predict the augmented version of those particular four frames. Got it. Um, but in the case where it's temporal, it would be like the subsequent or like the offset frame stack. Got it. Great. Thank you. Thank you both. Yep. Do people have other questions? Okay, then maybe I'll proceed. So we found that our conclusion is actually consistent with some other works in reinforcement learning. Both Red and Dr. Q here investigated image augmentations effect compared to other algorithms. These other algorithms all use some, some sort of self-supervised learning method. For example, curl here uses contrastive learning and planet learns the latent dy dynamics. Rad and Dr. Q empirically tested um, that image augmentation can outperform many other algorithms on these many deep mind control tasks. So is, actually, is image augmentation actually what we need? Um, it might seem reasonable in hindsight, but this is quite contradictory to our initial expectations. We were a bit surprised at this in the beginning, and thought that maybe there are some hidden bugs. So we actually spent quite a lot of time debugging it and making sure everything is correct. Um, and we gradually got to see that maybe there are deeper reasons why representation learning doesn't always help imitation. So the first thing we observed is the data set property. Behavioral cloning uses very similar um, optimization algorithms, loss types, and network architectures to image classification. So if our conclusion is this different, then there must be something behind the training data. We, so we plotted images from STL10, Magical, and Progen here. STL10 is a subset of ImageNet, and images on the same row here have the same class labels, or they have the same correct expert actions. So we can see that in classification data sets, there are much larger between class variations. So we can see very clearly, this is a class of cats. These are all cars and these are all planes. But this difference is much less distinctive for sequential games. For example, in Magical, the robot can choose to move left or right and the decisive factor here is really just a few degrees of difference. So two observations can be very similar when they actually require different actions. This is also the case for progen. So under this data set difference, many representation learning objectives that are originally designed for capturing coarse grained features in image classification can actually fail to be helpful Ideally, we want our networks to pay attention to only the most important features in an observation, like the one we show here. So 
these, these are images from the fingers thin environment and images on the top row are average inputs. And these images below are saliency maps computed through gradients of networks. For each of the smaller grid here, the darker the color, the more important a feature is for the neural network. And the encoder we use here to produce these maps are pre-trained by Sinclair, and it hasn't been trained by any imitation learning objective yet. So this is quite ideal for us because we can see that the network is already paying a lot of attention to important objects of our game, even though we haven't provided any expert label. Um, but this is not true for coin run. We find that saliency maps produced by a simpler pre-trained network only pays attention to the shape produced by the foreground objects and the background color. So intuitively, this actually makes sense because the Sinclair algorithm is designed to recognize that two transformed images actually uh, come from the same original one. So by paying attention to this general shape is quite an effective and smart way to get around its objective. But for us, we wanted to look at more fine-grained features like here is the agent, here's the enemy, and this is the goal. So in our experiments, we also didn't find many representation learning algorithms to do well on coin run. And we guess that this might be one of the reasons why. Um, so from this, we think there are two major takeaways. One is that we really need to be careful in providing the correct inductive bias in our algorithm design. We should be careful in checking whether those control relevant features are effectively captured in whatever algorithms we are trying to design. The second message is the importance of testing on a wide range of benchmark tasks. I think many reinforcement learning papers recently heavily rely on just Mujoko or DeepMind control tasks. And had we only tested these on Mujoko tasks, we might have incorrectly concluded that many algorithms are indeed helpful, but apparently this is not the case. So our final observation is that representations output by a trained learner doesn't really form meaningful clusters according to actions as we originally expected. So here are some TSNI projections of observation embeddings. The first image here is the cluster result from a Sinclair pre-trained ResNet 50 on STL10. These two images here are clusters using replications generated by a VAE pre-trained encoder. The middle one is labeled by actions and the right one is labeled by state values. So if you haven't seen this result yet, I think most of us would expect the action labeled plot to cluster more, like, more nicely like this STL10 plot. But in fact, the representations actually cluster much more nicely according to state values. We think this is quite an interesting phenomenon for future investigations. For example, maybe a rigorous examination of representation learning's effects on value functions or reward functions can provide some further insights. To conclude, our work provides a clear framework and code base for analyzing representation learning for sequential games. Our experiment's major takeaway is that image augmentation typically helps, but representation learning doesn't provide much extra values on top of that. We conjecture that this is due to between class variance, inappropriate inductive bias, and maybe unsuitable action prediction for these methods. And finally, our code base is quite clean and flexible, and it has lots of detailed documentations, thanks to Cody here. <laughs> we believe it will be super helpful if you want to incorporate representation learning in your future experiments or research. Thank you for listening, and we're happy to take questions or discussions. <laughs> Thank you. I'll, I'll stop sharing. Okay, round of applause. Um, yeah, thanks for the nice talk. Um, I'm pretty sure we have some questions. Florian, go ahead. No, Klaus, go ahead. <laughs> 
Yeah. Okay. Um, I was wondering, so thanks, uh, thanks for the talk. I am especially happy because this aligns with many of the findings that I've uh, had recently when, when working on similar things. I was wondering, so something that I noticed coming up in the literature in like the last four months to a year is representations which are, or representation learning approaches, which are actually informed by control processes. So for example, there is work by no, I forgot all of the names. There's some work by Amy Zhang, definitely. And there is uh, some work by uh, Mark Belmar and um, others. Have you have you looked and compared to those? I, I will I will look for, for a paper name before, because this is very vague. Um, I I might actually know the Amy Zhang paper. Are you referring to the bisimulation one? That is um, one, yeah, definitely. And the other one I had in mind is um, by Rishabh Agarwal, contrastive behavioral similarity embeddings. So, so these these kind of seem to do a bit more what you were referring to in the end, right? I was wondering if you had any comparison or if you think that those could be combined. Like, can we take ideas both from image processing, because it feels bad to throw these away, and uh, control informed representation somehow? Yeah. I think from the control um, theoretic side is definitely a very interesting direction. So for our work here, we only we only compared um, things that are closer to computer vision type of um, representation learning methods. And I think there are some other um, works that also did some evaluations on the paper you just mentioned. Um, I can I can send the link the paper link to the to the chat in a bit. Yeah, they did some other experiments with um, at least the Amy Jones paper. And I think uh, from, from them, um, the, the paper is called Representation Matters. And from them, I think they are also claiming that many of these representation learning algorithms help less um, compared with the baseline though they didn't explicitly compare with image augmentations because their experiments are mostly, uh, their, their experiments are mostly done on state-based environments, not image-based. Yeah, let me find out the paper and type it to the chat. Yeah, sorry, um, I think someone else also has a question or, or maybe class you you will want to follow up with this I'll, I'll leave florian first and then. okay yeah so i was um i was wondering um some of the representation learning schemes that we have which are sort of uh image based at the moment or you know more geared towards computer vision um you have especially these reconstruction um uh, representation learning methods for example, for driving, if you wanted to drive across a trail, you would have to reconstruct all the details about the grass that is nearby the, the trail. And it's not clear that that helps you in any way become a better driver if you're able to reconstruct the bees and the flowers and the, you know, in high res, all the details of the grass that is completely irrelevant to the actual uh, part of the environment which you want to drive. So, is there a way to measure how much the representation learning loss conflicts with uh, the actual imitation loss, uh, aside from just comparing gradients, I guess? Mm, yeah, I think this is a interesting question, but I haven't encountered any works on that. Maybe Cody or Sam, if you know any? So I guess like not so much on the question of like conflicting losses, but just sort of a note that I think this is part of what, like this motivation is part of why people generally expect, or like in many cases expect that contrastive tasks will work better than reconstructive ones. And so in, in our case, we sort of mostly mm -hmm. included the reconstructive tasks like as a baseline with the expectation that for this exact reason, you know, can a lot of contrastive tasks, especially with augmentation, the augmentation will sort of obscure small details anyway. And so you'll end up with like a more general representation. Um, that said, kind of like the same thing that Cynthia mentioned, sorry, still early for me, um, is that 
it can be a little idiosyncratic what is actually like salient in the case of the of a kind of mm-hmm. sequential game and that like possibly nothing about the environment matters except like the particular orientation of your car mm-hmm. um, and so um we do do joint training and so in that case you could potentially look a little bit at like the comparison of the gradient since that's a little bit more like you know you're training in an online way and i don't believe that we've done that um but but yeah this would be a little a little bit consistent with our kind of theory that actions are just not that actions are not a great analog for the sort of role that classes play in supervised learning Mm -hmm. um and yeah maybe just sorry uh jumping on this a little bit to kind of add some context for why predicting rewards might be sort of a better analog is just that you know states with similar rewards might tend to look more similar to one another than mm-hmm. states with similar actions, right? Like you can be towards the end of the game and want to jump and towards the beginning of the game and want to jump. And those are going to sort of maybe be very different in terms of their frames, but, and so like, if you're trying to predict value, those might be, those might get more benefit from just sort of naive forms of image similarity, where mm-hmm. the sort of like, when do I jump is gonna be like a much more diverse set of scenarios if you're trying to do action prediction. I'm sorry, that may not have been an exact answer to your question, but no, no, I think the gradients. I, I do. No, no, I think it's. Uh, I think it is. Um, yeah, and it certainly uh, aligns with things that we've been um, discussing in the group about uh, contrastive versus reconstructive uh, losses, for sure. But yeah, thank you. I'm very happy to let somebody else go first because I already asked the question, but I but I'm. I I would be interested in why would we expect contrastive losses to help at all? Oh, like I, I I get why why contrastive losses might have some some advantages over reconstruct uh, completely reconstructive losses, but at the same time they're still not going to be aligned with the control thing, right? It just seems like we exchange one kind of misaligned or mismatched representation learning with another one right the, the the fundamental problem and and some image augmentation as you just said might actually in some mdps make it harder to to differentiate states which should be differentiated so i, w- I was wondering like why would you say that contrastive losses hurt more than representation losses in the general scheme of things yeah, so I think I think these are just sort of like orth like not not fully orthogonal, but are sort of different axes. So I think it's like on the margin, basically, the concern is that your your network is going to be using a lot of capacity to be able to reconstruct the exact pixels of the next frame, and that that might not actually be sort of a useful use of capacity. But like you, but you know, so it's sort of like on the margin between all else equal construct contrastive versus reconstructive. We sort of maybe imagine the contrastive might be better. Though again, the augmentation point is is a good one. I think that I may be more accurately trying to summarize what our expectations were coming into this paper rather than sort of what our beliefs are now. Um, and I think the the sort of question about whether augmentations are removing useful information is maybe like more more a perspective we have now, kind of compared to going in. Mm-hmm. Um, we did do we did try a little bit of trying to do like action conditioned contrastive learning on the theory that it might. You know, like for example, it might be better to, to predict, okay, what is the subsequent frame given action A versus given action B? Um, and we, at least in our kind of initial investigation, didn't find that that added a lot of value. Um, and we did also do a little bit of looking at kind of dynamics-based tasks. So like basically dynamics is sort of a action-informed reconstruction task. And so in some sense that is at least a little bit informed by it being a sequential process because it takes into account the action. Um, yeah, I haven't read the the papers that I think you mentioned earlier, so definitely those might do that in like a more smart way. Um, but I think we did like any amount of trying to incorporate action information, um, and and indeed, you know, inverse dynamics, in some ways, and unsurprisingly, often performs well as a pre-training task because it is very very similar to. to um, you know, it's also trying to predict an action. It's just trying to predict an action from two adjacent observations, as opposed to predicting it from one single observation. I think this is really interesting. Thank you. And so it's very funny. I've heard 
I'm, I'm relatively new to RL, but I worked on similar problems with trajectory prediction, which basically uh, like traject human trajectory prediction for driving, which basically is kind of like behavior cloning. And even when you when you do self-supervised learning on state space, so not, not even on image space, um, you kind of have to be careful about which augmentations you choose. So what uh, we, we, the paper is not, not out yet, but I, I think I can say it already. So what we found is that the augmentations, uh, if, you, if you try to supervise directly on state space augmentations for, uh, for the self-supervised aspects of the, of the training pipeline, uh, the ones that perform well are very different from those that perform well for just augmenting training data. To, to improve. It's slightly different learning problem because you don't learn on images, but my suspicion uh, would be that something similar happens here. And another analogy was that contra uh, like what class that resonated with me a lot. It's not obvious why contrastive learning should perform per particularly well compared to other selves and types of self supervision. Well, to me, it actually seems contrastive should perform worse because humans have to define what are positive and negative examples. This is kind of hard. Actually. At least for, predict for, for prediction, we found it hard. Yeah, it is, it is sort of an interesting, or the question of operating from states also sort of brings up something that you know, we've talked a lot about in our group of just like what, when do we expect representation learning to be valuable? And that I think a lot of the historical belief is basically like, okay, you want to learn a simpler feature space. And that once you've sort of learned that simpler feature mapping or like a, a feature mapping that corresponds with like the salient features of the space, whatever, you know, sort of those happen to be, that it's faster to learn subsequent policies on top of that. Um, and, and and yeah, I think there are probably also other theories you could have, but that feels like sort of the most historical one. And so there's a question of like, when would you expect representation learning to like improve off of if you already have sort of a sort of coherent state space? Um, and I don't feel like I have a good mental model of what I would expect there. Uh, so for driving the situation is a little bit different there. It's a highly imbalanced regression problem because most of the time you just drive straight. And even if you don't drive straight, you take relatively simple terms. But all the interesting cases is basically where something weird happens. And for our I hope was that by doing some sort of representation learning, we learn more expressive representations that are still useful for the case where something weird happens. I see, that makes sense. So yeah, I guess you could think of it of like, right. yeah. Yeah, sorry. Oh, I was just, I was just sort of like spitballing, but I was saying that you can maybe imagine that the in, in the underlying in the sort of default representation the set of cases that you actually care about is sort of taking up a fairly small part of the space or a sort of part of the manifold and you maybe want to like expand or separate out those so that you can handle these edge cases better mm -hmm. compared to one another whereas you know maybe most of the space under the default representation is consumed by cases you don't really care about because they're just simple cases where you drive straight um but but yeah, I'm just kind of imagining from what you said. I don't have any background that is. Uh, no, that's exactly the case. One, one thing that struck me and that I'm actually really be happy that you pointed out is this obsession with the DM control benchmark, which <laughs> Where, where, where so many things align so nicely, especially because all the moving parts are the relevant parts, right? You had this very nice picture where you had the, the, had the saliency map, which, oh, wonder, oh, wonder, aligned with the moving parts, which are everything that's relevant in the benchmark. I was wondering, um, you, you said we need to, we need to um, evaluate on a more diverse set of benchmarks. Um, I think this is a very important point. Thank you for making this. I was wondering, would you have an intuition of what a representative set would now be? Because this is something that that I think a lot of people are struggling right now. I think a lot of people know that they might have to go beyond DM control, 
but it seems unclear to me what would be more representative while still somehow manageable and not kind of super specialized tasks. Um, I don't have perfect observation on what's, um, what are all the benchmarks used by current, like very recent published papers. Um, but my impression is that maybe people are generally switching from Atari type of tasks to um, progen and switching from deep mind control to more specialized type of deep mind control. Like, um, for example, it's specialized for safe exploration type of environments like the open AI safety gym. And so I think one important feature from uh, in one important consideration for the move from Atari to Progen is like the 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 problem of recognizing or of memorizing action sequential action sequences to achieve a, a specific task. And I think um, in general the machine learning or robotics community is caring more about the actual robustness of um, the networks and whether it has learned the most important knowledge that we actually wanted to learn instead of just using some tricks to get around our value functions. Maybe in the future, if there are more benchmarks that can do better in these and more specifically test what kind of image, uh, what kind of knowledge is learned by um, an agent might be very helpful, I think. So maybe this is one of the reasons behind the rise of several specified, uh, several specialized um, deep mind control variant. Yeah, and I think building on that a little bit, it might be useful to think about what are the different axes that. Uh, RL or just if a sequential task can vary on and like what are different kinds of realism. So you can imagine a task that is very photorealistic, but has a very simple action space or conversely a task that is like, you know, purely text based, but has a complex action space and both of those are sort of realistic in different ways. So I don't know that it's like a good goal to have a kind of one task that is going to be realistic on like all of the relevant dimensions. Um, and, and maybe it's a question of like, okay, let's try to push a little bit forward on this dimension, a little bit forward on this dimension, but also just kind of like have the humility of like recognizing you're not going to be covering, you know, things you don't test. Um, one, one minor plug for another project I'm doing is that we, uh, on another project that Chai is working on, we're working on kind of doing some imitation work on Minecraft environments. And we didn't get that. It, first of all, it's very slow, which is, you know, part of the thing we're gesturing at. Because uh, you have to use an actual game engine to all render all of your observations, and turns out that's slower than Majoko. Um, but but yeah, you know, in the future you could imagine, you know, that certainly has some elements of realism that could be interesting. Um, yeah. Thank you. I think you put several fingers into several open wounds here, but I really like the humility comment. <laughs> Might be missing from recent work in RL. Um, Cynthia and Cody, can I ask you like one quick question? Sure, sure. Um, so like I read your paper and looked at your slides and you were talking about how um, like representation learning, um, like it gives like comparable performance to um, image based like learning algorithms with augmentations. And I was wondering if like when you were using representation learning, um, did you like, was the end test? So once you finish representation learning, um, like, did you train an additional like policy that was trained on like fewer data than the original data set? Or was it using the, sa the same amount of data as the image um, me based method with augmentations? We were using the same, the same expert data. Oh, okay. The same like amount of data. Okay. Yes. And, and part of that was sort of as a, uh, if it doesn't work with the same amount of data, it's probably not going to work with less data. So part of it was that was seen as like, okay, let's see if we can get things to work at all when it has access to the same amount of data, or if we can get there to be a benefit 
Um, we did do some experimentation with smaller amounts of data or smaller amounts of data in the imitation set. And then you just get into a problem of, you get all of your policies to be very incompetent and unrealistic. Mm -hmm. And so it's harder to do useful comparisons. Um, but yeah, okay. we did do some, some playing around with that. There's also just a weird dynamic where it seems like you can actually learn pretty well on imitation with a small number of demonstrations if you train for long enough. Mm -hmm. And this is a weird dimension where IL is different than RL, where an RL training for more time also means access to more data because you're often sampling and like, and if you're doing on policy RL, so you're, you're, you're sampling new data in addition to having more training iterations. But in IL, even with a small amount of data, you can train for a really long time. So we found that we can actually do pretty well with a relatively small number of observations if we train for a really long time. Um, yeah, I'm, I was just asking because like um, when I was looking into the literature for representation learning for IL, like a lot of the, a lot of them, for a lot of them, the goal was to um, improve the sample efficiency of imitation learning. So like the idea is that by training like your representation on a bunch of data, you can um, reduce the amount of demonstrations that's needed to improve, like to get good performance with imitation learning. So I was wondering what you thought about that. Yeah, I think we actually uh, did quite a lot of experiments around this. So at the beginning, because our experiments show that with all of our data sets, we cannot actually have representation learning outperform the image augmentation baseline. So we were thinking like maybe if we reduce the data set by half of it, let's say using only um, 100 trajectories or even 30, 10, or even one single trajectory, would representation learning beat image augmentation at all? But I think, um, although we didn't do a full set of experiments, all our best choice of representation learning algorithms didn't beat imitation learning in all of these settings. So mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so at those point, we just um, decided that maybe it um, at several points, um, representation learning pre-train was pretty hard to beat image augmentation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Got it. Also, another thing maybe, maybe worth considering here is just the nuance of what constitutes a label in the context of a supervised setting versus an IL setting, or basically in order to sort of fully analogize the case of a sort of a kind of true self-supervised setting, you'd almost need to have random trajectories. And in, the, in this weird case, like, if you're already training your representation learning on trajectories where the actions are taken by humans, that basically is your labeled data. So there's a sense in which it, it's like a little silly to say like, oh, we use this big, basically labeled by the set, you know, by the sake of having actions data set to train our representation, but we're getting data efficiency by not using that much data on the IL itself, because you sort of already have that data. And mm -hmm. we did do some testing on fully random data sets and that like, and yeah, we, we found sort of like somewhat inconsistent results, but, but yet yeah, just sort of like adding that dimension of it being a little confusing to figure out what kind of like unlabeled IL data actually means. And that basically the only really unlabeled IL data is like truly random observations, which I think are obviously like harder for temporal methods because it's sort of like you're having less coherent kind of actions in the space. Yeah, and, then, and I remember, sorry, sorry, go ahead. Oh, yeah, and I remember our um, experiment results with random data is also quite mixed. So we can see um, them doing something good on DeepMind, on, on some tasks for DeepMind control, but for other tasks, it's actually decreasing the performance. So we were also quite confused mm -hmm. with this. Yeah. I see. And then just like one last question, um, by like image augmentations, like were you basically doing end-to-end -end imitation learning by augmenting your image data? Is that understanding correct? Um, would you mind elaborating a bit on end-to-end -end imitation learning? Um, yeah, so I guess just like um, we were comparing like representation learning with, with just like doing imitation learning, is that correct? 
um, using it's more like uh, using representation learning either as pre-train or mm -hmm. as an auxiliary loss to the imitation learning. Right. Um, but did you run like a baseline where you did imitation learning without representation learning? Oh, yeah, it was the um, in the slides. It was like IL with AU with aux and IL mm -hmm. without aux. So those are done without any representation learning, either for pre-training oh. or joint training. OK, got it. That, yeah. answer, that answers my question. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, sorry, not for asking for uh, further questions or follow-ups. Um, yeah, do we have more questions? Or someone want to add something? I guess not. Again, thanks. Uh, thanks. Uh, thank you for for the talk and the nice discussion. Okay. Bye. Thank you so much. Thanks again. Have a wonderful day. <laughs> you too. Thanks. See ya.